Fantastic. Um, so while the published research and the online information really provides a lot of helpful and educational information, it really doesn't tell the whole story. And it re really specifically when that comes to rural creative districts uh, experiences with the creative district process. So Idaho is a primarily rural state in case you didn't know that already. Um, According to the Department of Labor in 2018, they identified that 88% of Idaho's land is in counties cl really classified as rural, which accounts for approximately 28% of our state's population. And that means that Idaho is both a low density and a highly rural state. Uh, the Department of Health and Welfare also investigated rural counties and population density in 2021, and they found that Idaho ranked 44 out of the 50 states for population density. So they have about approximately 22.3 people per square mile. And we have 44 counties, 35 of them are considered rural. 16 of those 35 are considered remote. And that means that they have fewer than six people per square mile. So we wanted to know what other states with both that urban and rural population are doing to support their creative districts. And we wanted to hear from the leaders that, you know, face really unique challenges in their states and their programs, but also had different perspectives and approaches to what they were doing. So this led to Idaho Policy Institute conducting interviews with six different creative district program managers across the country. So we really have this nice, robust research of uh, published literature, information available online about programs, but then also these um, interviews that were conducted. And we'll hear from some of the program managers today from Washington and in Nebraska, but I wanted to share what that research is um, that IPI uncovered to set that national stage. So the information that IPI uh, presented is organized in four different sections. The first section is the certification process, and that really dove into eligibility requirements, program benefits, the application process and materials, uh, review process and reporting requirements. So a pretty robust section. Um, there's also district governance information that they went into. So what kind of different um, governance models there are and some state leadership. So what partnerships should be at the table and what are those metrics for evaluation? So even though we reviewed and in, looked into both the urban and the rural, um, we really wanna focus today on that finding from the rural perspective. So it may come as no surprise as well that rural communities face really unique challenges. So according to the National Conference of State Legislators, they really dove into nationwide what are some of those challenges that rural communities face. For those of you that are in a rural community, this may come as no surprise to you when I list some of these off. Um, but here's kind of a quick word cloud that goes over some of these. Uh, demographic changes within your community, workforce development, uh, access to capital, infrastructure, healthcare, uh, land use, but also environment preserv preservation and community preservation. Now compared to urban counterparts, rural communities also seem to face that they have less internet access, fewer educational institutions, uh, more hospital closures and experience less economic growth. So when IPI interviewed the program managers and reviewed the literature, when they were talking with these rural creative district managers, they found that they also faced, these rural districts faced unique challenges with the actual creative district certification process. Um, an example of one of the challenges that um, rural communities faced is a lot of programs have different requirements like walkability, the access to sidewalks or access to public transportation. All really great requirements, but sometimes that's not transferable to a rural community. It might not even make sense for a remote community to have some of those things in place. Um, another challenge that they identified was community buy-in, getting people on board to sit down and have the conversation. Um, sometimes rural communities found that leadership was more likely to get on board um, and support the dream once they saw that there was a measurable impact. Um, sometimes that has to do with those hard to navigate local politics, uh, but also it had to do with um, transitions of government positions. 
A third challenge that IPI really identified for rural communities specifically was capacity, uh, the capacity to track evaluation metrics and that data, especially qualitative, um, and then access to training resources and different tools. So even with all of the challenges, right, there are incredible benefits that have been identified with having a creative district and a rural community. Uh, for a lot of states, the managers felt that these rural communities had a positive experience going through the program. And they also thought that for the most part, um, rural communities might actually get more out of the program than their urban counterparts do. So those leading the creative district initiatives in these rural places um, often have a very personal interest in the outcome. Uh, and they also have expressed feeling empowered through the whole certification process. Uh, their districts are really strengthened by the rural identity of the place, as well as their niche. So before I get into my closing comments on this research, I wanted to also ask for those of you that are joining us today, um, with your community in mind, whether it be urban or rural, what part of its identity would you want to be considered when your community undergoes any community development project? So this could be what you consider the core values of the, the community that you live, work, or play in, right? Um, maybe it's uh, a historical event or a historical person that you feel should be recognized and considered when these community development projects happen. So using that menti.com, um, you're able to input as many ideas and thoughts in here as you would like. If you're not using Menti, you can pop those into the chat as well. Um, and feel free to keep adding them in as I share with you some additional insight from this research. I know we have a few um, community uh, development program managers here, so creative district program managers on the call. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, IPA had some really awesome actionable insight for those that have this program, um, especially for those with rural communities that they're offering this to. So one of the things that they really suggest for those developing a creative um, district program in their state or their region is develop a certification process that's reflective of your own unique characteristics and needs in your area. Um, you can choose the eligibility requirement and the program benefits based on your organizational needs, but also what's applicable to your particular districts. And what would be most relevant for this discussion is um, the finding that developing guidelines for both an urban district and a rural district and defining that for your own state is very beneficial. Another finding is having that conversation with these potential districts on what type of district governments models exist, and then helping them decide on which one is best for their district. Um, there's different things like a quasi-governmental or a nonprofit, or just a simply led volunteer artist led group. A third finding is having some potential partners as part of your program. So some partners to consider are tourism, transportation, uh, commerce, housing, recreation, humanities, um, and another way to create a really great partnership within your state or region is to have these rural communities form a cohort that would meet regularly, and that way you can provide some additional tools, training, and resources to that specific group. Another actionable item that you can have is including or providing an alternative to evaluation metrics. So really understanding um, more of that narrative, um, so a qualitative narrative, so it's more useful, more inclusive for folks, um, especially in rural communities where tracking that data might not be within that capacity of that team that's working in there. Um, you can allow the districts to choose what metrics that they're going to report out on, um, and you can guide them with providing some different categories or different things they can choose from. So for example, uh, if you wanted to offer land use metrics, how many businesses are operating within that district? Um, how, what's the occupancy rate of the buildings? Or what are the property values? Housing, what's the value and availability of housing in that area? You can also track, for example, de demographics. Um, what's the population density? What's the migration of the area? Things like that. 
And those can be also both qualitative and quantitative, so numbers and responses. So offering some categories and some options allows those districts, especially in rural communities, to kind of pick and choose what they're able to report out on and what's really relevant to what their initiatives and goals are. So for those of you that are joining from rural communities and you're like, that's great, that's a nice state level thing, but what can we do from a rural perspective and why should we create a, a rural creative district in our area? So some of the findings also shared why it's important and why it's relevant. Um, in many states, it actually reported that um, urban and rural community development um, or creative districts had comparable levels of impact on their state. And the benefits of having a, this program are economic, more data, more visibility, and increased partnerships. For rural communities, having that partnership between arts and non-arts sectors is actually incredibly and sometimes more important than urban counterparts. Um, for rural district, districts, once you're in a program, um, oftentimes communities become more aware of and more eligible for better candidates for other granting opportunities. So ultimately, it provides a way to address some of the challenges that rural communities face. Um, more access to capital and money for their community, a way to preserve community identity, bringing in those econ economic benefits to stimulate growth, um, providing partnerships. Uh, that way you can help with those knitting community members more closely together. Even if they're arts and non-arts, bringing those people together in a really meaningful and, and powerful way. It also brings more visibility to community and environment. And then that data that's gathered is a better way to understand the community as a whole, which is very measurable and actionable from a, a local government perspective too. So an incredible benefit. A creative district in a rural community can be that tool to address the challenges that those areas face. And it might not address every challenge, um, but if you approach it strategically and with the right local partnerships, it can bring and make measurable change and lasting impact. So to help illustrate the findings and kind of bring some, some lifeblood to all this information and data, uh, the Creative District Program Managers from Washington and Nebraska are here today to share about their programs. And there's four uh, Creative District Managers that are going to be talking with one another about how they started and managed their programs in rural communities. So with that, I'm going to pass this time over to Annette Roth, the Community Development Manager at Washington State Arts Commission. So thank you so much and take it away, Annette. Thanks so much, Allison. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're really excited about this. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of our program here in Washington State. And for us, our creative district program is focused primarily on economic development and on growing our creative sector. In Washington, uh, the creative sector makes up approximately 10% of the GDP of the state, which is about $60 billion annually. So it's huge. Um, and much of that is concentrated in the Seattle metro area, but not all of it. And so our program works to help communities across the state take advantage of the strong creative sector that we have here and to create opportunities for themselves. The next slide, please. We're gonna start with a basic definition for what a creative district is. So our definition is that a creative district is a right-sized geographic area in a community with a concentration of creative sector activities could look like um, theater, arts and culture, it could look like painting, sculpting, makers, um, you know, graphic designers, all of those kinds of things are part of what we consider to be the creative sector. Uh, creative districts are a focal point in a community and very often they are the jumping off point for folks who are coming to a community to uh, experience the local arts, culture, the history, and the recreation. We also see it as a vehicle for investors and businesses to plant and to grow within a community. The idea is that when you come to a creative district, you get a sense of what the community is all about. The creative district should ideally reflect the community in an authentic way um, so that it feels like a real place where you can experience something special, and get a, a sense of where you are. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Washington State Arts Commission has been focusing on the creative economy since the Great Recession of 2008-2011. At that time, we did some research um, commissioned through a number of partners statewide, 
and found that the only sector that grew in many communities was the creative sector. And so we wanted to be able to capitalize on that. Uh, we introduced the legislation for the program, for the Creative District Program in 2017, and we had broad and almost universal bipartisan support. And the program was signed into law that year by Governor Jay Inslee. Uh, the program launched in early 2018, and the first district was certified later that year. Uh, we did receive funding from the legislature to begin the program, but it was only $156,000 for the biennium, which was not quite sufficient enough to run the program. Um, so the agency had to find additional sources of funds for grants, which we dispersed as startup grants um, to the original few districts. Uh, fortunately for us, our program has been very popular and very successful, and so we have been able to increase the program budget and offerings over time. And I'm going to talk about what those are here in just a few minutes. Next slide, please. I want to just introduce you quickly to the process um, and how creative districts become certified in Washington State. So generally, it starts when one or two representatives from a community will contact us to talk about their interest in the program and how they think it could benefit their community. We as a state agency don't recruit communities or choose the ones that we work with. It's up to the communities to decide that they want to go through this process. And so we have an intake meeting with them to learn about their district and to provide them with guidance for next steps, which generally involves doing um, outreach to the community to engage um, and get more people involved in the planning. This is uh, step one, the forming part um, on this graph that you're seeing here on screen. And so we recommend that they reach out to the city, arts and culture organizations, artists and creatives, the school district, downtown association, destination marketing organization, economic development folks, local colleges, local tribes, the library, community members, commercial property owners, basically anybody who would want to have a vested interest in seeing their local economy expand. And so once they reach a critical mass or enough people um, in a smaller group think that this is a viable option for them as a community, they begin to plan their district. Um, this is kind of step two. It's based on our community readiness toolkit that we offer to all districts who are going through this process. So they'll convene a steering or a planning committee to start doing the work of broader community engagement, determining their community vision and values, and laying out uh, steps in a strategic plan for the future. Now, these two steps can take anywhere from six months to, well, we've seen two years or more. Um, you know, COVID obviously extended the, the timeline for several communities, but the average is around 12 months. And so once a community has gotten through this planning process, uh, they can apply for certification. We have a process that they follow, which includes submitting a letter of intent to us, and then they have 60 days to submit their full application to us. We will convene a, a panel to look at an individual application we do not um, have communities compete with each other for that. Um, and so if the community is approved, then we work with them directly to help them launch their program. Next slide, please. So our process is a pretty straightforward community development process or community placemaking process. We do have some universal criteria, um, but it is customized for each community because we recognize that every community works differently and has different needs. So one of the things that we do is work with the communities pretty closely as they go through the process to make sure that they're able to um, hit benchmarks, to make sure that there aren't any um, glaring issues that they might have if they were trying to become a creative. Uh, the whole process for us and for the communities is to foster authentic and diverse community engagement. Uh, oftentimes these conversations that they have amongst themselves bring up larger, more complex ideas, such as how the districts um, can help to shape their communities for the future, how they strengthen lo their local relationships, how they can help to boost the economy and infrastructure, all using arts and culture um, for that long-term benefit. Uh, now, because we don't have as much funding for our program as some of our peers, like Nebraska uh, do, we have made a calculated decision to help focus communities on the capacity building and building long-term partnerships with an eye um, toward long-term self-sustainability. Um, and the program offerings that we have reflect that pretty strongly. And so this is why we have an open application process so that communities can submit an application when they are ready and will be able to be successful. We don't wanna force anybody into a program that they're really not ready for. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the community development and the creative placemaking part of creative districts is about getting artists and designers, community groups, um, cultural affairs folks, arts organizations, and regular folks out of their silos and working together. You know, obviously having a defined arts and culture identity is important to developing a creative district, but in order for a district to be successful long-term uh, and to make systemic change within their community, it requires broad community partnerships and strong um, community support, all working toward a larger goal, which very often for rural districts is to you know, maintain their, their, their community and to make sure that, that it can continue to thrive for the future. You know, for us, um, municipal uh, approval is a requirement. Um, it's built into our legislation, um, but it's also because the districts generally exist within a city or a town boundary. Now, um, Allison mentioned that sometimes it can be challenging for that. We have been relatively lucky in that um, municipalities do see the, the um, benefits eventually. I know for some, for some folks, it takes a little bit more time. Um, but it is something that we need them to, to do. And so the underpinning of all of this is a solid workable plan for long-term growth. And those plans um, are what make our districts successful. Next slide, please. So this map um, shows all of the currently certified creative districts in Washington, as well as communities that are actively working on certification. So we've worked with other communities as well. There's probably about a half a dozen or more other communities that we've worked with, um, but for various reasons, primarily COVID, uh, they've not really made too much progress. And so we don't consider them to be in the active planning state. You know, again, we wanna make sure that we can work with communities for whom they see the benefits and recognize that this can be transformational. So we have 12 certified districts currently. Um, the first one was Edmonds, which is a suburb of Seattle. Um, and with Chewila actually coming a few months after that. And the most recently certified district is Burien, which is also a suburb of Seattle. And so you can see on this map at the bottom um, that Vancouver, which is just north of Portland, Oregon, is in pre-certification phase, and which means they actually submitted their letter of intent last week and are actively working on their application. So we um, expect to see that within a few weeks, and we anticipate that they will be certified before the winter is over. Now, currently our districts are split equally between urban and rural. So we have six rural districts and six urban districts. But what we've seen is that there are more, um, the more burgeoning districts uh, are in the urban and the rural areas. And so we average about three to four new districts per year uh, with the exception of fiscal year 21 when no districts were certified. So this was of course during the height of COVID and a lot of the communities that we had been working with at the time Put their work on hold um, because they had, you know, sort of bigger fish to fry, as it were. And for a lot of the communities who are um, either creative districts already or are working on this, they're using the notion of a creative district to help um, sort of knit their communities back together after COVID and also to help reinvent their local economy as, you know, conditions around the world change. Next slide, please. So like I mentioned before, we didn't start our program with a huge amount of funding. So we had to be creative with how we supported districts. Um, our program budget has grown um, almost fivefold over the past two biennium, but it is still lagging a bit in what the districts need from us in robust financial support. And so what we do instead is provide a significant amount of technical assistance. We um, have meetings with them, strategic planning advice and facilitation of meetings, we do community visits, um, and a lot more. Um, we try to make sure that we have a strong network amongst the districts so that all of the districts feel like they can, um, they're peers with each other, that they can connect with each other, that they um, can, you know, partner with each other sometimes even if they want. And so we try to make sure to listen to them and to adjust our program offerings to meet their needs. So an example of this is a rural coalition, which we hold bi-monthly. Um, we've been doing it for about a year and a half now, and it's specifically for our rural districts. And it's a way for the districts to come together, to talk shop, to learn from each other, uh, to learn from us. We uh, invite subject matter experts sometimes to discuss topics um, for them, such as fundraising or succession planning for their creative districts. Um, you know, and this program was started with from direct feedback from our rural districts, many of whom are volunteer organizations. And so they requested that we could help them do internal capacity building so they would be more effective. They also felt like when we were in larger groups with the urban districts, that sometimes their um, 
their concerns weren't being heard or that they couldn't quite get it, right? They couldn't, they didn't quite feel like they could understand the same issue that a, that a creative district that has a half a million dollar budget, for example, um, has. And, and so we wanted to provide a space for them to, to be able to become more effective. Each district uh, is automatically eligible for a startup operating grant upon certification to help them launch their program. Um, right now, this is a one-time one grant. It's something that we're hoping to change that in the future, so we can provide additional funding. But that's what we have now. And then we're also able to apply for capital project grants from a pooled fund to do small-scale built environment projects, such as mural projects, community kiosks, festival spaces, um, all within the boundaries of their district. We have an excellent partnership with Washington State Department of Transportation to provide state branded signage on state highways and interstates near the districts. Um, WashDOT has generously offered to underwrite 75% of the cost of construction and installation of the signs with the districts covering the remaining cost. Um, so this has done a lot actually to increase the visibility of the districts and we have a fantastic partnership with WashDOT and they've been wonderful to work with. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so creative placemaking and creative districts look very different in every single community. Uh, they're based on the community's unique map, makeup, the assets, how it sees itself. Often the geography has a big influence on what the sense of place is or what it becomes. And the values of the community influence how the creative districts um, move forward as well. And our agency uh, takes equity very seriously. And we know that equity looks different in different places. So equity can be raised on geography or on socioeconomy, as well as race or gender. Um, urban, suburban, and rural districts all have very different needs. And so we've worked hard to create a program that is robust, um, but also takes those needs into account. And so ensuring that we can be flexible with our program is key to that. The legislation you know, has its requirements, but also we do have the ability to make adjustments um, as, as we need within that. Uh, our program philosophy is to meet them where they are, right? We want districts to come into this process feeling supported and wherever they are is not a bad place to begin, right? And so um, an example of this is our grant met program. Now this applies to both our startup and the operating grants. Um, and so for the startup grants, under-resourced or rural communities can bring a half cash, half in kind match to the table instead of the full one-to-one -one match. So, you know, um, it, it makes it a little bit easier for them to be able to start up their program. Also for the capital project grants, uh, we have a sliding scale match reduction. So traditionally for capital grants in Washington state, oftentimes the match is three to one, four to one, five to one, which means that if you get a $10,000 grant, you have to bring 30, 40, $50,000 to the table. Now our capital project um, pilot was funded for fiscal year 21, which began in July of 2020. Um, and so uh, several of the uh, already uh, certified districts, most of them rural came to us um, with concerns that if we follow the sort of traditional playbook of um, capital grants in Washington, they wouldn't be able to raise funds for the projects or even compete for the program at all, right? So they wouldn't get projects at all. And so we actually found a model at the Washington Recreation and Conservation Office um, that, we, that we adapted a little bit. So first of all, we lowered the match um, to one-to-one. -one, and then we also reduced match requirements uh, for rural and or lower income relative to state household income communities on a sliding scale. So what that basically means is some of the districts were able, they only had to bring 25% match to the table, meaning if they had a project that they were asking for $10,000 in grants, they only had to bring $2,500 to the table. Now, on the one hand, it seems like, and it means that these projects in these um, communities are smaller than the projects in the wealthier communities, but it also means that every single community had an opportunity to have a project and that they've been transformational for the communities. Um, oftentimes, these projects have led to other projects, and in some cases, they've led to additional revenue streams because the district administrating organization has demonstrated the ability to make things happen and to get things done. And so other community partners now see them as a viable option for doing community development. 
And as we move forward, um, our agency continues to look for ways that we can provide more value to the communities because we wanna make sure that these districts are viable for 10, 15, 20 years into the future. Um, we're planning for the next biennium as we always do and when we're in state work. And so we are going to be submitting a long-term funding package um, request for the districts so they can have a more reliable long-term source of income. Um, there's more to come on that. So uh, that's our program in a nutshell. And I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Rachel in Nebraska to share more about their program. Great, thank you so much, Annette. Um, I am gonna let those slides pop up there. Of course, I have a slideshow for you. All right, um, I wanna say once again, thank you for joining us uh, today to talk about Creative Districts. My name is Rachel Morgan. I'm a program specialist at the Nebraska Arts Council. Our program here in Nebraska is fairly new and you're gonna see some similarities between us and Washington's program. However, there are a few differences and things that we found that just kind of work better for our state. Next slide. During our time today, I'm going to give a brief overview of the program, um, which will include the history, the purpose, benefits, eligibility process, and then the grant programs that are, that are associated with our program. This won't be an in-depth dive uh, into the program. So if you have specific questions, please feel free to either drop them into the chat or um, the very last slide in all of these will be my contact information. And you can always contact me directly um, if you wanna know very specific questions. <clears throat> Next slide. So I do want to start out by saying that this program was a long time in the making for us. Uh, the Nebraska Arts Council looked at creating a program like Creative Districts for approximately 10 years. We held conferences with our constituents talking about possibilities and looking at the arts from a community viewpoint. We talked to senators about the benefits of such programs. We brought in other state agencies that already had a creative district program to talk to our legislators. And finally, in 2020, uh, we were able to get legislation passed to create a program, but there were no funds attached to it. Uh, so the following year, we worked really hard and we were able to get funds passed to support the program. Uh, the bottom line is work with your legislators if you're a, a state that wants to get a program like this um, in the works. Next slide. As we created the program, we wanted to create a mission statement for it that would succinctly tell everyone what the purpose is. Creative districts are meant to show the arts as an economic driver, support communities in Nebraska in telling their stories and elevate the value of the arts. Next slide. So there's many benefits to a program like Creative Districts. Creating a place where people want to live and work will attract and retain artists and creative businesses. It will also help retain young people in your community. It will encourage business and job development. And by providing things for people to do, it will establish the district as a tourist destination. The program can also be used to preserve and reuse historic buildings, which is incredibly useful in rural communities. Each community has a unique identity, and this program really helps um, communities identify that and use it to their benefit. Here in Nebraska, we have communities that, for instance, might be the Swedish capital of Nebraska, um, or we have Red Cloud, that is the childhood home of Willa Cather. Or perhaps there's a rich history like Brownville, which is located right on the river. Um, maybe they have a collection of barn quilts that are throughout the community and this is what ties them together. But no matter where you travel in the state, every community has a story to tell. Next slide. To be eligible as a district, they need to have a unique identity, which we just talked about. Uh, it also needs to be walkable or it can be easy to navigate because we do know that that changes in rural communities. And you'll tell us how it is, how it's easy to navigate. Most of the time, a district is centered around the downtown area. 
uh, districts do need to have partnerships as well. There must be a cultural entity involved in the partnership and also a representative from the local government. The cultural entity can be anything from a museum, a gallery, or a performing arts center. And then the reason for having that representative from the local government ensures that the government is supportive of the district um, and any new projects that they may want to take on, especially if they're going to require city or um, board approval, city council approval, it's really important to have them already have that buy-in into the creative district. Uh, the district also needs to have a district administrator, and that's the entity that is responsible for all of the reporting, any funds that are awarded, and then is our direct contact. So there's that one person um, that I can contact. Next slide. Here you can see a flow chart that shows the process. It starts with district sending in a letter of interest, um, and then it ends with a district is certified for five years. In between time, um, every year they need to submit an interim report. And that's how we're going to track the data to show that the program is successful. So we're going to ask for things like sales tax, lodging tax, um, those type of um, data collection points so that we can tell that people are visiting the district and that the program is successful. Next slide. After uh, a community sends in, in a letter of interest, uh, they'll have a conversation with us. And if we feel that they're ready to move on, they begin working on their eligibility assessment, which uh, we affectionately call the workbook in our office. Um, I, I'm not going to lie, the workbook is lengthy. It's 44 or 45 pages. Um, so it is a time commitment, uh, but it lays the groundwork for the district. It walks them through asset mapping, uh, talking about the district management, so who's in charge of what, and it begins to talk about goal setting. So in that way, you're able to see what you already have in your district, and you can begin to identify things that you either want to add or you want to build upon. Next slide. So here we're going to use our Mentimeter again. And so one of the things that we require as part of this process is gathering information from your community. So here's a question to you is how do you do that? Are there ways that you've already um, been working with your community and gathering uh, input and talking to your community and finding out what it is that they're interested in? Um, you can use the code and the link there. Michael's also dropped it into the chat. Uh, if you don't have Mentimeter up because you thought, oh, I'm done with this, we're not going to need it again, uh, you can always drop it into the chat. That is fine, too. Wonderful. These are great. Wonderful. All right, next slide. See, that was really just a sneaky way that I could get a drink in while you answered that. Um, so um, all of your answers were fantastic. Those are all things that uh, we talk to uh, with our communities, focus groups, town hall meetings, public surveys. Um, you'll see the uh, an example here on the screen um, of a survey that a community did that they posted up the posters around town so people could do it uh, whenever they were out and about. But by gathering that community input, you're designing community where people want to live. Um, the other thing that we want to make sure is that you have artists and creatives as part of that planning process. So if you're going into those community meetings and you look around the table um, and you don't see any artists, but you know they live there, <laughs> it's a time to kind of reevaluate and make sure that they're invited to those meetings and that they're a part of that process. Uh, once a district uh, completes the workbook and it's sent in, it is reviewed by a panel of reviewers. Uh, we gather a panel that is made up of different agencies. So for instance, a Department of Economic Development 
uh, the Nebraska Community Foundation. We also invite representatives from other state arts agencies. So there's a mix of people on the panel who know the community and also don't know it. So they have that fresh perspective and they're reading the workbook from different lenses. We do a site visit, uh, which the image on the screen is from our site visit to Brownville and is honestly one of our favorite parts of the process is being able to come out and see the community. The uh, district is invited to submit a strategic plan, which is also reviewed by the panel, because the idea is, is that all along the process, the community is getting feedback from experts in the field as they walk through this process. The strategic plan includes projects that the district decides that they want to work on. So they've held community meetings, you've talked about what you want to do, and this is actually putting it down on paper saying, yes, this is the direction we're going to go. Um, next slide. So now that we know what we want to do, we get to talk to the fun stuff about money, right? Um, there's a variety of grant programs that are associated with our Creative District program. The Capacity Grant is actually a partnership with the Kiwit Foundation here in Nebraska, um, and it's designed to help districts complete their workbook, or maybe they need to hire a consultant to help with some of that community planning and community engagement. But the idea is, is that grant helps communities on the front end and helps them get through the certification process. The certification grant is $10,000 and it's awarded when a district becomes certified and their strategic plan is approved. This initial award helps them get things up and going. They can quickly jump into a project and kind of keep that momentum going uh, that they've gathered um, while getting the community together and involved. The development grant is available to them after the district becomes certified. They can apply for up to $250,000 in that grant. Uh, the projects in the strategic plan should be reflected in this development grant because that's what they said they were going to work on, right? Um, both the certification and the development grant require no matching funds. You can use those to go and parlay that into other funds and you can use them as matching for others, but we don't require it on our end. The other two grant programs that are listed are a little bit in the future. Uh, the Department of Economic Development has a fund through their agency called the Civic Community Center Financing Fund, or CCCFF for short. In 2024, this program will be available only to certified creative districts, which is why we're working so hard uh, to get districts certified now. And then the sports arena funds are made up of sales tax that are collected from communities that have sports arenas here in the state. We have to wait until our portion of the funds adds up to 1.5 million, but once that happens, we'll be able to make grant awards out of that fund. Next slide. So what are some of the projects that you can work on? Um, they can be community enhancement projects like murals or public art. Uh, you'll see a photo there of a flag design contest that Ashland did for their district, and you're going to hear from Ashland in a little bit. Uh, the image of the bulldog is actually a partnership with the Recycling Center and Alliance, and they're made up of plastic bottle caps, uh, which I absolutely love. Um, the district could also host events that welcome people uh, to their community, like maybe a summer music series or an artist market. Uh, communities may want to create marketing material, like a visitor-friendly website that tells people where businesses are, when they're open, and what there is to do when they come and visit. Or a district may want a more in-depth plan, um, and so they can use grant funds to then hire a consultant to help them through that process. Next slide. So now that we've kind of thrown out some ideas of things that you could do, um, and if you had money, what would you do in your community? There's no right or wrong answer. So throw out some ideas and see um, what is it that you'd like to do? And once again, you're gonna use that Mentimeter, that menti.com and that code. Uh, if you don't have Menti up, 
you can always throw it into the chat and we can catch it there as well. Kiosks, kiosks are a big thing that is really becoming popular. I see that a lot. Wonderful. Oh, these are great. Fantastic. Creative lighting. I think that's really fun. That can be a really good time. All right. Next slide, please. So the idea is to think big. Um, maybe you have an empty lot in your downtown area. What is it that you've always wanted to do but never had the funds? Um, or maybe you have a beautiful historic building in your town, but uh, the idea of renovating it just seems really overwhelming. And we can kind of um, help get that started for you. Next slide. So one of the most frequent questions is, uh, what communities in Nebraska are working on becoming a creative district? So here's a map. Um, this shows that the program is popular, I would say coast to coast, we're not coast to coast, but all across the state, right? Um, it's not something that was designed just for Lincoln and Omaha, which are our more urban um, locations. We have five districts officially certified right now, um, and I've got that sixth one out to reviewers, so I, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, the Red Stars are communities that sent in their letter of interest, and they're in various stages of working on that workbook um, and doing that community engagement. Uh, and then the Blue Stars are communities that have sent in their workbook uh, and are either being reviewed or working on their strategic plan. And then you'll see the officially certified ones. Um, and next slide. Oh, go back one more. All right. Um, <laughs> so um, that was a very quick overview. Uh, there is more information on our website, and I'll drop a link uh, to our website into the chat here in a minute. Uh, and then I'll also drop my contact information for those of you that maybe have a very specific question about Nebraska Creative Districts. And if you want to reach out to me, um, I would love to make that contact, and we can have a conversation about it. All right, great. Thanks so much for that, Rachel. That was really interesting. It's always fun for us to see what are the similarities and differences amongst the different state um, programs. So I um, have the pleasure right now of actually being able to um, guide the sort of conversation that we're going to have here with our creative district representatives. So we have four of them. Two are from Washington State and two are from Nebraska. I'm going to go ahead and just read off introductions for um, the district uh, administrators that we have joining us. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Mike Bentz of Chewila, Washington. Mike is the board chair of the Chewila Creative District. Chewila is a town of about 2,600, and they're located in Northeast Washington State. It was the first rural district in Washington and the second creative district in the state. Uh, the district is administered by the nonprofit Chewila Creative District, which was formed specifically to run their district. Um, Mike, you want to just wave hi or whatever? All right. Uh, well, yeah, thanks, Annette. And actually, uh, thanks to all three of the panelists. I, I stopped taking notes because I'm going to watch the recording. <laughs> There's just too many good tips there. So um, other than that, uh, I'm ready to go if you are. So. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mike. All right, next I'd like to introduce Caleb Fiorni from Ashland, Nebraska. Uh, Caleb is the executive director of the Ashland Area Economic Development Corporation. Um, they are part of the Flora District, which was the first certified creative district in Nebraska. Uh, the city of Ashland is the official district administrator, but the Ashland EDC works with them to accomplish the district goals. Ashland has a population of about 3,100 and is located between Lincoln and Omaha, which are the two largest cities in Nebraska. Caleb? Yes, thank you for having me and looking forward to uh, hearing what all the other panelists have to say. Great, thanks for joining us. Uh, next, we have Mari Mullen um, from Port Townsend, Washington. 
Mari is the executive director of the Port Townsend Main Street Program, which is the administrator for the Port Townsend Creative District. Uh, Port Townsend is in rural Northwestern Washington on the Eastern side of the P Olympic Peninsula. The population of Port Townsend is about 10,200 and Port Townsend was the sixth creative district in Washington, one of our lucky ones that was certified right at the beginning of the pandemic in uh, 2020. So Mari, welcome. Thank you for having me and I've learned so much already. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Excellent. And then finally, we have Steve Wirth of Brownville, Nebraska. Uh, Steve is the president of the Brownville Historical Society, which serves as the administrator for the Brownville Creative District. Brownville is a village of 142 people and is situated on the banks of the Missouri River in the southeast corner of Nebraska. So while the population of Brownville is small, it is home to eight nonprofits, which all came together to plan their creative district. Steve? Welcome everyone. I'm glad to see so many people interested in the Creative District program and uh, be glad to share with everyone today uh, how a, a really small town can get off the ground with this program. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Okay, so for um, we're going to do a round robin kind of conversation here with everybody just to kind of set some expectations. And if you do have uh, questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we have folks monitoring the chat, as Allison mentioned earlier, and if the questions are relevant um, or we have time at the end to answer them, we will. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So uh, Mike, let's start with you, since you are a representative from our um, oldest creative district amongst all the districts. So how did you guys get your program off the ground? Um, well, thanks, Annette. I think the uh... It started with a community leader that attended a meeting you did in Olympia, actually became aware of it and brought that back home. And um, at that point, uh, kind of put the message around to the various nonprofits, so the Chuila Arts Guild and the Chuila Center for the Arts and the Chamber, that this might be a program that we would consider. So after that, then we put together two public meetings that were heavily advertised and heavily promoted. Uh, both of them were in the evenings. One of them was on a Tuesday and one of them was on a Thursday. And the purpose behind that was to just give a, a large overview of what a creative district was because it, we were in our infancy from that standpoint. But more importantly, make it interactive and proactive and get feedback from the public of what they would like to see um, in the future of, of Truila with uh, definition of the arts and, and economic development tied around that. Um, that was very fruitful. Um, we ended up with 40 or 45 people attending both meetings. Um, and then we kind of put that together, uh, a small group initially, I think there were like five of us or six of us, and decided to, to get more traction that we needed to uh, pull in some what I, we end up calling collaborative partners. And so the Creative District started as a collaborative partnership between uh, the Tuila Center for the Arts, the Arts Guild, Stevens County's Libraries, the the uh, Tuila Schools, the Chamber of Commerce, the Tuila City Government, uh, a, an organization called Tri-County Economic Development District, which is a development district of three Northeast Washington counties. Um, we were lucky enough to uh, have a general member come in that was a management professor for the Washington State University Extension, north of us uh, in Colville, and a couple of local uh, I would call champions of the of the community. They've been around a long time. And so once we put this collaborative uh, group together, then uh, it was kind of like, okay, now we've got this thing. What do we do with it? You know, how do we get started? And one of the things that came up, and, and there again, thanks to Annette, is uh, she had introduced uh, an organization called uh, Colorado Creative Labs. Um, and uh, so you, she was able to give me the name of a couple of contact people. And I called and was fortunate enough to talk to one of them and basically asked, would you getting started? How'd you guys get started? And uh, he sent me a, a piece called 10 Community Readiness Principles. And we still use that today. When we have our annual meeting, we go through these 10 principles to make sure we're hitting on all of them or which ones do we need to strengthen and things like that. And so that, with that, uh, that gave us a framework or a template to follow, to build out the organization. And then we had uh, a lady by the name of Deborah Hansen, who was the uh, adjunct professor for w WSU, 
uh, who's pretty well known for doing what they call a ripple mapping for an organization. And what the ripple mapping does is you bring in your, your key uh, people in the community, in this case, the collaborative partners, a couple of local business owners, um, and you develop a system of uh, identifying needs and values. And then by developing that and narrowing it down, we came down with key six key components that we felt the creative district could address within the community. And then uh, I guess once that's done, we uh, basically decided that uh, we went through the work process and you know all the things that uh, was talked about earlier. And once we got certified, then we decided to make a big deal out of it. So we started out with an open house. Yeah, we are lucky enough to have a local brewery that a lot of people like to go to. So, you know, that was our location, which happens to be a creative and fits into the creative district you know, model very well. And uh, had a fair number of people for a small community. I think we had 115, 120 people attend the open house. Uh, we had a rollout presentation we put together and then that became a roadshow. So that presentation was made to of uh, some civic groups in the area. It was made to a variety of chambers. It was made to the Tri-County Economic Development. And we were just getting started in our second round when COVID shut that all down. But what it did is it gave us a, a good framework of contacts of where we were able to, to continue, I guess, kind of behind the scenes since uh, we couldn't meet uh, uh, in public at that point forward. And then okay. when we, pardon? I was going to say, great, Mike, we want to make sure we can provide um, space for everyone to answer the question. So um, okay. that sounds great. That was a great story about how you guys began. They were um, certified in 2019, so it had been certified for more than a year before COVID shut them down. So um, next, let's go to Caleb. Let's go to you. Yeah, again, thanks for having me. And uh, I'm so excited to see all these uh, participants today. Um, so Ashland, uh, situated right between Lincoln and Omaha. Uh, we're very fortunate to have two big cities in our backyard, and we really uh, enjoy that. Um, how we started this program, uh, the Nebraska Arts Council actually did a week-long workshop uh, talking about different topics each day about the Creative District. Um, and, and since it's a brand new program they were rolling out, uh, we thought this is a, a natural marriage, knowing that we have four galleries on our main street alone. So uh, it, it felt uh, a, like a natural pairing to, to look into this, this program. One of, the, one of the very early things that we did to get the program off the ga uh, ground was um, introducing the topic to the different organizations around town. So our, our economic development members um, heard about it, our board members, uh, the city council, I spoke to them about it. We uh, went to the Chamber of Commerce so that the businesses could hear about this, this program. And then the initial uh, start was the workbook. Um, we looked into it and then we started with asset mapping first to see how much creative inventory we could come up with. Um, so I invited everyone for a wonderful wine and cheese night and actually uh, locked the door behind them, gave them pens and told them to go right on the wall and start the asset mapping. So um, we had a very, we have a very extensive list. And then from that point on, we knew that we needed to form the committee because this was going to be a, a, a process we wanted to do as a, as a community. So uh, that's how it initially got off the ground. And we're very excited to see the fruits of the labor from that work. Awesome. Thanks for that, Caleb. Uh, next, we're going to go to Mari. Mari, why don't you tell us how you guys got started in Port Townsend? Thanks, Annette. Uh, well, originally in 2013-2014, in we were on a committee with the Jefferson Community Foundation that had applied for a Creative Vitality Index grant through ArtsWA, and that really showed that Port Townsend scored highly on the metrics for being a creative community. And you know, the, it was really about accessing data to local employment in the arts and support for the arts and the economic impact of the arts through organizations and individual artists. And, and we do have a really strong climate in Port Townsend, a creative climate. We, we have you know, festivals and movie festivals and live theater and great restaurants, summer outdoor music. We have so much going on, so wonderful galleries. And we wanted to look at the creative district as a way to 
have people come together and really connect audiences with artists and support our creative economy. And we also wanted to link our downtown, uptown and Fort Warden areas through wayfinding. So uh, we, we did a number of steps. We, we also wanted to survey artists to determine their needs. And our goals are also to create an artist registry and an arts and culture plan, which will give us a roadmap for the next three to five years. And uh, we also, in 2018 and 2019, attended creative district meetings, some of them put on by Arts Law, and we learned about other successful creative districts in the country, such as the Colorado program, which if you haven't looked that up, they have a very robust creative district um, effort. And then we uh, formed a large steering committee of, of 20 plus community leaders and in a cross section representing the arts and um, nonprofits and city government officials. And we met a number of times to determine how the creative district certification would serve Port Townsend best. And some of the questions that we addressed were what were the overarching goals and who could be involved in making it happen. And the creative district goals we decided was to really support a year round creative economy in Port Townsend and connect audiences with artists because right now we have a very robust summer season but you know how can you how can you keep that momentum going in third and fourth quarter and, and first quarter and other questions were like what would be the footprint of the creative district and we decided ultimately it was downtown uptown and Fort Warden what would be the focus areas. And that was determined that we wanted to focus on visual arts, performing arts, literary arts, culinary arts, um, and maker's arts. And then also who would be the entity that would oversee the grants and be the fiscal sponsor. And it was determined that our, our local Main Street program would be that entity. So um, it's been a, it's very rewarding. We were certified in uh, May of 2020. And you know we had a public meeting much like Chawitla was one of the requirements of the process and we heard about priorities from the community, but over 80 people came to that. And then once we got the designation, it just really created a lot of excitement and brought partners to the fore, like, such as the city and other arts organizations. And also I just wanted to say that the documents that were required as part of the creative district process have really served us so well. We use them today still, so it really, just helps you organize and think about what do you what do you need to get your strategic plan in place and how is that going to serve you over the next few years. So. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mari. Thanks for that story. Um, Steve, what about you? How did you guys get started? Well, in, in uh, Brownville, two, there basically are two things for us in Brownville and, uh, and, and one I'm going to talk about the overall program. It's uh, I'm going to start with the latter. As Rachel indicated, uh, we would not have a program at all without first getting the support from our state legislature. And uh, it, some of you may or may not know, but Nebraska is a unicameral state, so we only have one house. And our state senator, who prides herself as a fiscal conservative, uh, was not supportive of the program until she heard from several of us about what the program uh, that you know could mean to us as a, a rural communities, and uh, then she supported it, got on board, and uh, got several other senators to also support the program and the appropriation that went with it. Uh, now we involve her extensively in, in our events, and uh, and she loves it. So I think you know as an ongoing kind of thing that it's really important for all of the creative districts and the states to, uh, to get those legislatures, legislators on board and, uh, and to help them involve with the program. Specifically for Brownville, uh, a large part of our access, success, uh, it, we actually owe to Rachel herself. And that's, you know, without her help and guidance, uh, you know, we probably would not have been successful in getting through the process. As she mentioned, uh, we have a 45 page workbook that goes extensively through the community, uh, what your inventory, all, all of the kinds of financial kinds of things. And, uh, and, and it was uh, pretty torturous to get through, but we made it through with her help. And I think that's uh, another important part 
for a lot of the creative districts is that the administrator for the overall program, uh, like the people who have talked today, that, you know, if their involvement with each of the creative districts and their help, I think, is, is one of the things that makes it successful. And, uh, and I think the other creative districts here in Nebraska would probably agree with that sentiment. And then, as Mike also indicated, I think it's important for each creative district, especially when you first get started, is to have that single individual who's willing to drive the entire process to completion. So we're a village of 142 people, and uh, we, uh, we have eight nonprofits and multiple arts related businesses. So trying to put our creative district together by committee would have just basically taken us forever. Uh, so we needed basically one person to champion that entire process to pull all of the entities together, uh, coordinate the meetings, collect the information and drive that process uh, to completion. And uh, currently that, uh, you know, that person then acts as a manager for the whole group. Uh, we've set up a management process so that uh, you know, with eight nonprofits, we could end up with 40 people at a meeting. But what we've done is limit, it, limit the executive committee uh, for our district to the presidents of each of those nonprofits. So that's the executive committee that makes all of the decisions. And I think, you know, those... Uh, the couple of things there with Rachel's help and a champion for the process, support from the legislature, those are the things that helped us get off the ground. Great. Thanks so much for that, Steve. Um, it's always interesting to hear how the different communities kind of get started, and there's a lot of similarities between them, but each one of them is unique um, for, for, those, for the districts. So we're going to move on to the next question. And so this is, this is sort of a quick one. So this is a lightning round of a sort. Um, we're gonna start with Caleb. So Caleb, really quickly, just share with us what's the one thing that you guys did that you think made you the most successful, that you feel was the most successful? Um, I'd say the most successful part was the actual partnership creation um, between our economic development group, our city and our arts council. The arts council had uh, prior to this 20 plus years of arts programming throughout the city. Um, so it felt like a very natural marriage and a very natural uh, thing for us to establish a committee um, that was mayoral appointed. So uh, with the exception of two permanent members being uh, the Economic Development Office and the Arts Council Office to form that framework. Uh, so I'd say that is probably the most successful piece of it. And then having our committee meet monthly to discuss the issues, go through um, the strategic plan and see what, what needs to be addressed before uh, the end of our, our deadline, and then uh, execute that plan. So seeing the committee put through the effort and get the workbook done and go for um, the next phase is probably our, our strongest piece. Great. Thanks for that, Caleb. What about you, Mari? What do you think is the one thing that you've been, has made you most successful in Port Townsend? I actually had two things, but I, I would say when you have a strong collaborative team, you can move mountains and they help find the grants they and the donations and they, they cut through the things that are slowing you down so you can really have a forward momentum. And we also have a creative district subcommittee that meets monthly and that really uh, keeps us on track and we have homework and we report back at each meeting and uh, and just having the arts law designation and having the, the backup and resources of arts law has really strengthened our efforts because through those rural coalition meetings, if you hit a bump in the road, you know that, you know, you've got a nut and you can call and they will do their best to help. So I think having great, great partnerships is, is the key. Great. Thanks for that. What about you guys, Steve? What's the one thing you've done that has made you feel most successful? I, I'm going to kind of continue the theme here. I think that the desire of all of our nonprofits to work together for the benefit of the whole community has been a, a kind of a key factor for us. 
Uh, everyone has worked together to make sure that we were able to collect all the information that we needed for, the, for our application and also to come together for a six-year plan, uh, which is a requirement to get certified here in Nebraska. And, uh, you know, that plan then outlines everything that each group, group wants to accomplish, not only individually, but also what we want to accomplish as a, as a whole for our, our district. In addition, the plan outlines a vision for the future for Brownville. And, uh, and I believe that the smaller the community, probably the more important it is to have that vision and, and plan for, for your future. That's uh, in all of that, you know, would not have been feasible without support and appropriation from the state. So without them, the program would not exist and, and we wouldn't be on this journey. But, but uh, again, I think the vision and the plan are, are what's going to make us really successful in the future. Excellent, thanks for that, Steve. Um, and how about you, Mike? We'll go back to Chihuahua. So what is one thing that you all have done that have made you feel like you've been successful? Well, I, th I think beyond the comments earlier about good people and communication, uh, what we consider tangible evidence that it's actually working. So we focused our efforts early on on developing a very robust website and social media presence. And we continue that at the very top end on a communication issue uh, today, which shows recognition and newsletters. And it's it's really very robust. And then Thanks to the grant we got from the Washington Arts Foundation, our first public projects, we, we made it pretty robust. And, and so we did three murals, we added wayfinding signs in the community, we did a sign garden, and we put an informational kiosk in, all in very key locations that were highly visible. So, you know, we truly believe it's gone from like, who are you guys to what are you guys type of an environment. And it makes it a lot easier to talk about it uh, when you talk to people, of course, for fundraising or volunteer help or in-kind contributions, so. Excellent, thanks for that. Okay, so um, we're gonna go to our next question and we're gonna start um, with Steve. So let's talk about, you know, we've talked about the good things that have happened and how you guys have been successful, but now let's talk a little bit about the issues. So give us your number one issue that you guys have faced and how have you been dealing with it? Uh, did I mention that we are a village of 142 with eight nonprofits? <laughs> so all of whom, you know, for the most part, have their own agendas. So as you can imagine, um, you know, we have a very diverse set of, of opinions to address. So in addition to uh, just getting everyone together, uh, you know, is sometimes an issue. So... Uh, you know, our executive committee, which is our decision-making group, just consists of the presidents of all of each of the nonprofits and a representative from our county tourism and, uh, and our community development fund. So that makes up the executive committee. And then uh, that group is pretty diverse. They includes a medical doctor, uh, a key employee at the local college, an educational service unit manager, a lawyer, a, a tugboat pilot coordinator who is only on the West Coast 50% of the time. So uh, along with, you know, our retirees. So pulling them all together so that we can finalize plans, make decisions is a challenge in, in, in itself. So to deal with this, we established early on that so that we could finalize our plans and make decisions um, that we would establish a 50% quorum that could make decisions which everyone would live with. And, uh, and that's in each of the presidents also can use an alternative person providing that the, that person is, is up to speed. So if they can't attend, they can send an alternate. And that, um, that whole process has, has worked for us and allowed us to uh, continue to move forward and complete our process and complete the grant process. Fantastic. Okay, um, Mike, we're gonna go over to you. So what is the biggest issue you all have faced and how are you dealing with it? 
Um, well, I think there's actually two. One of them initially was what I consider skepticism and of the, the organization overall. And part of that has to deal with people uh, and their general, I think, feeling of what the arts actually mean. And so once, uh, once actually I was told that a creative is anybody who works with their mind in their hands, then it became very easy to, to, to get around that, that argument. And then like Steve, we had the silo problem of various nonprofits that have been successful and bringing them on board. And then ironic for us, because Chuila is going through a revitalization right now, is uh, we've got a gentrification argument. Uh, they, they saw this coming in and changing the small town values and makeup of the town. So we had to focus in on good communication and projects that actually enhance those values uh, versus taking them away. And then the other one I think is pretty common is financing. You know, where does the money come from? And, uh, you know, I, we, we attended a meeting a while back from a different organization. They said that if you want to be successful long term, your, your dollars have to come from three sources, you know, grants, donations, and memberships. And so uh, we put that in our strategic plan to make sure all three of those cylinders are firing at all times. Uh, and then, of course, the, the hurdle behind that is the manpower behind it to get it done. So. Excellent. Thanks for that. All right, Caleb, so let's go to you. So what are some of the issues you have faced and how are you guys dealing with it? So I'd say there's one big issue that we had uh, pretty early on after the certification was governance structure of the committee and what is its mandate and purpose uh, once we have completed the, uh, the grant. Um, so we took two months to look inward and actually collect ourselves and figure out how do we want to set this committee up um, for success in the future. Um, with different uh, people that may serve on it that might not be the original founders. How do we work well with the uh, other organizations and how do we collaborate with the city and help with reporting and, and any other uh, issues that may arise with that? So um, that was the early conversation and the early issue we found. And so the idea was let's create some bylaws that establish what groundwork and what um, the framework of what we need to do to get certain uh, measures accomplished. So um, in in there, for example, um, we decided that since economic development and the Arts Council are permanent members of this city committee that make up that, that triangle uh, partnership, we need to make sure that there is broad support from chamber members. We made sure that we've gotten our school on board. So our, our school district is a partner. Um, which is currently building a performing arts center. So that's going to be a very nice utilized facility uh, that we're really excited about. Um, and so we, we made sure that there is representation from among all sectors of the city and then uh, and the community. And then on top of that, made sure that the economic development and arts council sit on the sidelines uh, when it comes to executive decisions. We want to be supportive, but we really want the community to be the ones that lead. Um, and so that's really set us up for uh, success. But that, I'd say that was probably our early on challenge uh, right after the, the grant was, how do we govern this? Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, and Mari, what about you all? What are some of the issues you face in Fort Townsend and how are you dealing with them? I'd say, you know, our creative district uh, was approved two months after the pandemic hit. And so it really... Uh, forced us to look at our strategic plan and re rearrange the original order of it to determine the steps forward that we wanted to make during COVID. And, and during COVID, like a lot of uh, places, our funding froze and our, our public outreach for the most part stopped. And we did refocus and pick a few things that we could work on. And we ended up collaborating with the city and gathering information. But we probably should have focused more quickly on social media outreach during COVID. And so we lost a little momentum there. And then during COVID, we did put together an innovative wayfinding art marker project, which um, solicited proposals from local and regional artists. And we raised, uh, it was an arts wall grant, infrastructure grant that Annette talked about earlier. And we raised matching funds and in-kind contributions for it. And the goal was to thread people through the creative district. And the artist who um, 
was selected chose white as the initial color for the art markers. And then the idea was that the markers would, would weather to gray over the years and match our wharves downtown and our, in our seaport town. But unfortunately, um, the white color made those uh, art markers a target for uh, political statements and graffiti. And while we did try to reach out to the, um, those responsible, we weren't successful there. So we consulted public art experts and worked with the artists to change the color to teal, which is the color of the Creative District logo and, and the accent color on the signs and the reception for that's been very positive. And I, I think the other creative districts would echo many of them. Just sustainable funding is a is a you know whatever a challenge that we continue to face. But we we've, we've got some promising uh, leads for 2023, which we're excited about. Excellent, and that actually leads us um, to a question um, that we're going to start with you, Mari. Um, so, and this is about funding, right? Because we know that that is one of the biggest challenges um, for any organization or any any group that's starting from the beginning, right? And you all are starting to create transformation within your communities. So how, how do you find other fund funding sources? What have you been doing to help get other funding sources and how has that been going? The best solutions we have found have been grants and then finding matching funds and uh, working with our partners. So we actually uh, put out our signature fundraising event this August, uh, which was called Soundcheck, and that was funded through sponsorships. And it was a really successful week-long arts event that, that focused on our local artists. And for this next year, we're going to um, work on diversifying the funding for that. But it was it was really fantastic. It was a had a local filmmaker showcase, poetry readings, dance demonstrations, outdoor films, youth artist projects, a uptown street fair, a songwriter showcase, just all kinds of great uh, local talent showcase. So that netted um, a little chunk of change for our, our creative district. And we have been discussing a membership program, but we feel like things are still sort of uncertain post COVID. So we're gonna hold that idea for now and continue to focus on grants for 2023. And in terms of finding out leads for grants, our subcommittee members and city staff keep on the lookout for grant opportunities for us. And that's been so helpful. Um, and you know, sustainable funding is, is a continuing uh, issue, but through the rural creative district meetings that Annette's hosted, we, we have gotten some good uh, funding ideas from that. And, and we have relied on our Main Street program, our fiscal sponsor for um, administration and maintenance assistance and grant writing and reporting and the insurance needs. And so, so far this year, you know, we've uh, last year was the Wayfinding and Art Markers project, and then this year we're just about to wrap up a, a, a wonderful placemaking grant um, with the Tyler Plaza Lighting Project. We did the Soundcheck Festival, and we're working on the RFP for our arts and culture plan. So those are all ways we're going to solidify our, our creative district efforts and look to attract some more funding in 2023. Awesome. Thank you for that. That's a lot of great stuff that you guys have going on. Um, next, we're going to go to um, Steve, and uh, we'll ask you that same question. So how are you all looking for additional sources of funding? First of all, I, I, I want to give a kudos out to the Nebraska Arts Council. Uh, you know, for our, our development grants, the $250,000 grants that we're eligible for as creative districts here in Nebraska, they require uh, no match and provide the funding up front. So we obtained a $250,000 know, grant from them and within a week, that's in our account, you know, so we can start writing checks. Uh, you know, and I think for rural areas, especially, especially you know, the smaller uh, the communities are, uh, the more important those kinds of things become because they have, you know, uh, funding resources are fairly limited, uh, you know, the smaller the community. So it's a, uh, kudos out to them for that. And then here we, we stay linked into every website uh, and email list, you know, that has a potential to provide us with funding. Uh, and, and each of us, 
our nonprofits, uh, when we come across something like that, uh, we distribute it to everyone, uh, you know, so that uh, whether it would benefit a particular group or not, everyone gets a chance to see it. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, they may come up with ideas on how they might be able to use that source. Um, we use the grants.gov website. Um, one caution, it, uh, and that's even the Nebraska Arts Council requires this. Many state federally funded sources also require that, that you have to be in the federal system to apply for funds. Uh, this can sometimes take time. So uh, that's something I would recommend to everyone. You know, if you get, uh, you know, even if you don't have a current need, you know, go into that grants.gov website and get into their system so that if an opportunity arises, uh, you can take advantage of it and you don't have to go through that uh, painful process, you know, after, you know, and, and not meet a deadline kind of thing. And then uh, the last thing I would say is um, attend conferences. Uh, those uh, are a great source of information about opportunities that you might not otherwise be aware of. So, you know, just linking with other people, you know, of a similar mindset, you know, can sometimes give you uh, new perspectives and ideas. I know I just recently went to the Nebraska Tourism Conference and, uh, and came back with, with several ideas about how the Brownville Creative District you know, can take advantage of a few things. So those are the things that I, I would throw out there for people. Awesome, thanks for that. And thanks for that recommendation about getting into the grants.gov and getting your UEI, which is the number that you're talking about. Um, yes. And that's really important. We have the same constraints here in Washington as well for some of the grants that have been coming out um, through federal funds. So Mike, um, let's go to you. So how have you all been working on finding other funding sources? Um, often. <laughs> so I guess the, uh, like Steve, you know, we follow the grants.gov um, and we are registered for that. And that actually pops up every day. So uh, you can, if you stay on top of it, but more importantly to me, it gives you ideas where else to look. Uh, but beyond that, uh, you know, I continually monitor the Arts Washington website because sometimes there's things that pop up there that don't fit, but maybe fit. And a good example of that is they came up with a Renew Washington grant, which is an education in arts in the schools. And we applied for that, but it was outside the box, but they came back and said, okay, go for it, see what you can do. So um, I think uh, we have a good relationship with the regional person for the Washington Department of Commerce. So Julie keeps us informed at all times of what might be going on there we can tap. Uh, the uh, Washington State uh, Tourism Board, which is a private entity, uh, reestablished itself. So we became involved with it. And tourism is a good place to get dollars. Um, and the creative districts, by definition, are touristic, I guess, in, in nature. Um, and so that one actually just came through last week for us. Uh, in the state of Washington, they have city and county lodging tax revenue. Uh, that comes off of a tax they put on the hotels, motels, RV parks, et cetera. And uh, the city, we applied there, and it's broken into two pools, one of them for marketing purposes to bring people into the area, and the other one is capital improvements. So it's not new improve, new projects, but it's existing projects that you can apply to get refinished or refreshed, and we've had really good luck there. Uh, we have a couple of, of private foundations in the area, uh, that are open to the arts. And so we continually apply there. And one of them we actually got a little bit the other day, uh, various organizations, private individuals. You know, um, in one of the presentations we attended, they say, all people and all the entities have a thought process of two checkbooks, one to pay the bills and one for philanthropic needs. You just need how to tap into that one, the other one. So we keep that in front of us. Uh, and then corporate donations. Um, you know, we became aware of uh, of a uh, organization that actually works through Microsoft, and we have a variety of Microsoft employees in our area that donate, and so we just got registered. 
Um, and uh, so we're looking for some donations from them. And then the one piece of advice I think I'd give everybody is to get into a rating service. And we use one called GuideStar. It's part of the Canva organization. Uh, that's a very, very good service. Um, and uh, that allows you to give a, a sense of credibility, I guess, on the front end, but it also gives you access to people that are looking um, because we got a donation from someone we didn't even know existed uh, because a guide star came through an organization called DonateStock.com. So I guess early, often, and never stop. <laughs> Those are words to live by, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and Caleb, we're going to finish this question out with you. So well, how are you guys trying to get additional sources of funding? So the quick answer is ditto to the other three panelists because they basically said everything and exhausted the list. Um, but one of the other things I'd have to say is uh, uh, tapping into our foundations, uh, foundations that um, align with the Creative District mission. Um, those are a, a good chance to go and ask for, for donations there. Um, looking into uh, membership opportunities, but then again, um, we, we're also brand new and, and still starting out. So some of that stuff's in the back burner and we're waiting. Um, thankfully, we do have um, a business here in our, our downtown that sells ornaments for a particular project that our creative district's working on. And so any of the funds, uh, any of the profits that she sells from these ornaments, for example, are going into our foundation and sitting there and just accruing over time. And they have been accruing for about 20 years now. So we already have an initial um set of money set aside for the start of this project so we're pretty uh, thankful that she had the foresight to do this before the creative district uh, even came up as a, a program um and then keeping in touch with your local state economic development uh department that's a that's a great one um i check their website constantly i pester uh the ded all the time and see what new um grants are available. Um, I'm sure they blocked me by now, so um, I recommend their website. But um, that's probably the best way to sustain the future of the uh, of the uh, creative district is um, showing its worth, proving it, and then going to the correct people and saying, we're, we're really looking for donations to keep this going. Here's what we've done so far. Here's what the tax roll looks like and what we've brought in. Here's the tourism. Here's the out-of-town plates that we've seen and be able to really make them feel good about um, seeing their money being used um, and put to work. So, Excellent. Thanks for that. So, um, you know, that's really great. I just want to kind of follow up a little bit on just um, something that you just said, Caleb. And so all of you have done projects. And I'm curious to know, have these projects provided follow-on funds for you? Have you seen that there's been an uptick in people being interested um, in that you don't all have to respond. Maybe one of you, two of you um, can, and then we're gonna turn it over to the um, community to ask questions. But I'm just curious to know how the project funds that you've had, that you've received, have helped you to grow your programs at all. Um, if you don't mind, I can start with that. Yeah, that'd be great, Mike, please go ahead. You know, we did the tangible, you know, the murals and the kiosk, et cetera. And once they got completed, we actually had people coming to us offering their buildings to begin with. Um, be, and so that really drove into us that there was a community awareness of what was going on. Um, and then that allowed us to comfortably be engaged in the city as far as they're going through their revitalization program right now. So they, they brought the Chihuahua at place at the table. So as they do that, it's an inter the Creative District is an interview to that. And the same thing for the Regional Tourism Board through Tri-County Economic Development District. Uh, we have a place at the table there now too. And all that because I believe the projects um, showed that it could get done. And it got done in very professionally in a really short period of time. And then we track the economic impact and we know that 80% of the dollars that were invested in those projects were not put into the local community. That's great. Thanks for that. And Caleb, uh, go ahead. Go. Okay, uh, so right out the gate, when we started our uh, creative district, we wanted to immediately reach out to the community and do a, pro a program. So the very first thing that we did as our uh, creative district 
uh, we did a city flag competition. So we had so many different designs, so many different people submit designs. Um, we had about 120, over 120 submissions for, for what our new city flag will look like. Um, and then we gave everyone in the community or has a tie to Ashland a three month period to really get those creative juices flowing. Um, after that, we closed the window on submission. We uh, then took all 100, 20 plus submissions to city council and they had the fun task of narrowing them down to three. Uh, that was a, that was a real fun day. And then immediately right after that, we put the um, vote out to the people. Um, we didn't do a ballot form. We did more of a, we did Google form. We had our library involved. Uh, we had the community involved and then we even opened it up to the school district. So we had kindergartners through senior year vote on which flag they like. So get the uh, kids into the civic process early. Um, so, and then what they did is they came up with a, a new city flag. So, and that was our very first um, creative district project. So the buy-in was pretty immediate um, and, and they saw that, wow, this group's doing stuff. And so we have seen a little bit of uh, donations from uh, the, the ornament sale go in that it's gonna help fund our uh, larger project down the road. That is fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you all, Mike, Caleb, Mari, and Stephen for um, your words of wisdom and your insight today. Um, you know, if I could take a couple of words that I kept hearing over and over was partnership, community engagement, you know, um, community, 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 right? And so that's what the whole point of these creative districts are all about. Um, so thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel. Um, who is going to kind of guide us through the Q&A portion of the, of the day. We have plenty of time for people to ask questions and like the chat was blowing up. So Rachel, you have a task ahead of you. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah, I, I will have to admit, I am probably going to focus on questions that all of you can answer. Um, so some of these more specific questions, um, we will probably follow up with people individually if there's something very specific about a certain state um, or a certain creative district, um, because I'd like to have as many of you interact um, as we can. So um, one of the things I'd like to go back to, and Mike, I think this was you that started to touch on it, is the issue of gentrification. Um, and I know it's something that it is a very big issue. And so we're not going to solve it today. Let's just put that out there, right? We, we're not going to have the world's, um, answer to gentrification today, but can you talk to us a little bit, um, in, in any, but I think it was Mike that brought it up, um, is how, how do you find that fine line? How do you create a community that is for artists but then it becomes so popular that, for instance, housing costs and, you know, rent starts to rise. Right. How do you find that fine line? Boy, um, well, I think to begin with is just recognize that it's an issue and, and it may or may not be real, but, you know, it's real in people's minds. Um, and then they, they can point to various locations, even in Washington State, where they the town has become effectively gentrified and it's no longer affordable. They can't affordable housing, you name it. So, so you just address it head on. You start with the city council and you get the city council buy-in and we're lucky enough here that the city council is very sensitive to that. So they're looking at different zoning ordinances and building codes and whatever on their side of the, to, to really stop that. Um, and then really promote the idea of individual placemaking. And so you take a look at your empty storefronts or maybe just the back room of an existing storefront. And how do you create that on a cost affordable basis to bring in an artist or to bring in a creative one type or another? And then, uh, you know, we're lucky enough here to have the Spokane tribe of Indians on the south side of our, of our city. And they're developing a program for incubators. For, and so is Tri-County Economic Development District. So it's just being involved to make sure your hands raised saying we'd like to, to be part of that. Um, and then just, you know, just ensure and talk it all the time that you want people here, you want them here to enjoy the area, spend a little bit of money. And if they're gonna move here, move here for the right reasons. 
Um, and, uh, and I think that can happen. It's just not going to happen tomorrow. Great. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Mari? Well, one of the things that we're getting ready to do is send out an artist survey to determine how our creative district can best serve them. And part of that does um, talk about, you know, what, what do they really need to do their work? What do they need a brick and mortar space? Do they, you know, is, is there live workspace available? Do we need more? And also in our, in our long-term goals for our, our creative district arts and culture plan, we, we want to establish a, a, a plan that outlines ways that we can support existing efforts to advance the cause for affordable housing and live workspace for artists. So it, it is a big topic. And, and one of our impetuses for the creative district was to have it be so artists could make it a living in Port Townsend. Often people would have two and three jobs here to just be able to stay here. So how can we buoy up the whole creative economy so that people can be more successful in their artistic field? Thank you, Mari. I know, uh, you know, here in Brownville, based, you were such a small community that uh, with such a large collection of arts and and uh, the 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 nonprofits, the music, theater, the the arts themselves, humanities. Essentially, the community ends up being uh, half, you know, fifty percent devoted to the arts and and tourism, and and the other fifty percent. Uh, are the people who have lived here forever that the rest of us impact, you know, with uh, with the things that we're doing, and and so uh, we have to be, and we're sensitive to this, so we have to be careful though to involve uh, the entire community with the things that we're doing, and uh, and not just our own. Um, the group, you know, with that's devoted to the arts, we uh, we need to make sure that that we involve everyone, uh, with, you know, with the things that we're doing. Caleb, yeah. Um, so I think that's always going to be a very big issue, and it's always a touchy subject as well. Um, I would say. Creatives need to be part of the decision-making process and need to be heard as well. Um, we can't assume what they want is going to be best um, served by someone who isn't creative. Um, so that being said, um, one of the issues that needs to be portrayed is having community-wide town hall and, and understand what it is that your community is wanting to see and then plan it out 5, 10, 15 years in advance and then start to slowly paint that picture over time um, with little with little adjustments here and there to, to be course corrected. Um, that's something that we want to do here and, and we are doing in February, we're having a, a community-wide strategic plan. Um, anyone that lives in town is welcome to come to the strategic plan and give their opinion on what they wanna see their town look like in the future. Um, and we've encouraged our creative district to also be in attendance because they're a very big part, just as the businesses are, um, that are going to help shape the way Ashland's going to grow. And if we leave them out of the conversation, then that gentrification can happen. And then uh, we didn't have a plan for it. So getting them in early on the conversation and making sure that um, they're a part of the process and decision making, it will help mitigate that as much as it possibly can. Great. Thank you. Um, next, I, I want to take you all back <laughs> to when you were first creating your district and you had the idea that you wanted to do this and you wanted to create a creative district. How did you go out and take this concept and introduce it to your community in a way that they understood what it was and what the program was and what you wanted to do? 
what what are some kind of concrete ways um, that you, you went out and, and shared this information so people understood what a creative district is or could be? Um, you know, I think from the Tawila perspective, uh, we had the opportunity to attend the cultural conference prior to becoming a creative district. Um, statewide, it was in Toppenish, Washington. And um, from a personal standpoint, what I got out of that, which was easier for me because my background relate was the economic benefit of a creative district in a local community. Um, and that uh, the, the state um, had some pretty good data on the creative industries and what they provide. And, you know, in, in, in a community where the extraction industry is primarily logging and mining, had basically gone away with logging coming back in somewhat, uh, you needed to find a different way to create an economic base. And since we had some pretty vibrant, um, engaged, uh, uh, creative, you know, arts organizations in town was to bring them together. So that was all incorporated in the presentation I talked about. So it was easy for me with a business background to go in and talk to the chamber, for instance, and say, what's in it for you? But it was also easy for me to talk to my neighbor to say the economic benefit of this, you know, is going to help you too because of you know, the cultural aspects of things, taxes, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, you know, just personally that it was easy for me to relate. And then, like I said earlier, getting a better understanding what a creative was, you know, it wasn't just the fine arts. I mean, it was as broad as spectrum as you can think of. So then I could get most people to relate that, yeah, I know a creative, or maybe I am one. I just don't know it. Absolutely. Yeah, I think for us, oh, okay, go ahead. go ahead, Steve. No, I was gonna say, I think for us, you know, it basically it was a road show. You know, we went mm. to each of the nonprofit to their annual meetings and to various meetings to talk about the program and potentially what it could do for us in bringing us all together and the, the potential benefits that we could gain from it. And, and of course, the funding sources that were opened up, you know, as a result of that. Uh, and it, and it, uh, the, with Rachel's help, it was pretty easy to sell, I think, the program to everyone. And, and uh, for the community as a whole, uh, it's, you know, a little tougher, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we've been able to show results to people. And, and I think that's, that's a key. If they can actually see things happening uh, as a result of the Creative District, and we're putting our logo in the Nebraska Arts Council logo on, on everything that we do, you know, as a Creative District, so that, uh, that people know that that's where it's happening. And, and that's helped us. Uh, Rachel, I would say uh, to that question, for the very initial beginning, um, the people that we ran to talk to, um, well, we already had the economic development group on board, so uh, I was the one that went and uh, <laughs> threw that information out at everyone. Um, but initially, I started with the framework, the triangle of city and arts council and economic development, and I wanted to make sure that those were those were the organizations that are on board and would help satisfy one of the requirements in the workbook. Um, and then once they gave their initial blessing and yes, we'd love to do this, then then we rolled it out to the community and, and said, here's, here's the program. Here's what it's going to do for our town. Here's what we've got in town. Here's how this is going to enhance what we've got in town. And from there it was, oh, okay, well, can you get it done by tomorrow? And then it put a target on my back to get it done by the next day. So, but initially I'd say starting with the, uh, the partners that have to be invested um, and, and getting them on board and then rolling it out to the community really helped get our, our group started pretty quickly. Wonderful. Mari? I would echo that. I think that the steering group of, of 20 plus community leaders representing different sectors, everyone from city council members, our mayor and our arts, arts organizations and our art museum and all our nonprofits, our community foundation, we would meet to map out what do we want this to look like. And then one of the um, 
activities um, later that fall after we had decided we wanted to go for the creative district designation was to hold a community meeting and about 80 people came to that and it was community members and many artists and uh, it was very informative and learning what what their dreams and hopes were for the creative district and what it could bring to Port Townsend over the next three to five years was it was a great conversation and a great starting point. Wonderful, thank you. Well, our time is almost up. Um, I am going to ask our tech people. There is one more slide that we are going to throw up onto the screen. Um, and while they are doing that, um, there was a question that was dropped into the chat that asked about um, the state's requirements, your own state's requirements for establish, establishing a creative district. I would say um, if you're not sure what that is, reach out to your state arts agency um, and they can help you. And if there isn't a program um, through them, they can either point you in the right direction or have that conversation with you. Um, but I would say your first contact is gonna be your local state arts agency. So um, what I would look at you, you guys know what to do, you're on this. So if we were to offer some more webinars, if you found this helpful and you'd like to see some other um, topics covered, please drop them into um, either the chat or to use Menti. And um, while you're doing that, uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone attending today. A special thank you to our panelists, um, Mike, Mari, Caleb, and Steve. Um, a big thank you to the staff at the Washington State Arts Commission and the Idaho Commission on the Arts um, and the Nebraska Arts Council. Uh, there's a lot of people working behind the scenes to make this all happen, and we really appreciate all of their work. Um, if you have questions um, that you want to be followed up, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I'm going to speak on behalf of my fellow panelists that we'd be happy to answer questions and share more with you. Um, and we will follow up when we send a recording of the webinar and we'll follow up with contact information. So if you have specific questions um, for uh, specific states or one of us, uh, you'll have that information and uh, you can get in touch with us. And as I said, there will be a recording and we'll send that out. And thank you for attending and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much, everyone.